Tim Sackett's 2024 predictions for talent acquisition next on the Rec Tech Podcast. All right, you know, we love him. HR influencer Tim Sackett is here to talk about his predictions for the coming year. And just a reminder to the audience, Tim is not a life coach. Tim, good to see you, man. <laughs> good, to, good to be here. Good to be uh, into 2024, that's for sure. Definitely, definitely. First, I want to get your thoughts on 2023. It's kind of a turbulent year in TA, a lot of layoffs, acquisitions, weird job market. What were your thoughts going in from last year? Yeah, um, it was, it is it was, like weird is a good a good word for it because you had this kind of odd, like you had layoffs happening like in, around the tech sector and really a lot of high priced kind of talent acquisition people losing their jobs. And the rest of the world was still on fire, like trying to hire people. Um, and so like, it was weird because the media was trying to portray like the, that it was bad economy and bad jobs, but every other like metric was like, no, we still have super low unemployment. <laughs> you know, we're still struggling to hire like every, it didn't matter like what part of the year I was in. If I went to a conference or I went and talked to a head of TA, they were like, we cannot find enough like people like it, without skills, with skills, it didn't matter. It was just flat out. We need more. Um, and that to me, like, so I was always like this weird disconnect between what was happening. And then you go, oh, the interest rates and you don't get free money anymore. And all these tech companies and, and they overhired and like, so it all kind of made sense from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was definitely um, like fractured in weird ways, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it should be interesting for this year. Uh, you know, I'm predicting. Uh, I, I tracked 39 uh, acquisitions in the space last year in HR tech. So, my prediction is that I think we're going to see more in 2024. Oh heck yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I think I'm there's so that. many startups in our space that are struggling to get more money to keep going, and some really good products. And I think those who are sitting on some cash um, out there and doing well, and you know, I think they're going to be able to pick off some really good good tech. I had one, one of those CEOs who um, works for a company that is sitting on a bunch of cash asked me, they're like, you know, cause it's always the, the platform play or does this fit with what we have? And, and they were like, Hey, doesn't it make sense for us to pick off some really good tech and just like, keep, keep going with it? Because once all this kind of turns around, like we'll be at, you know, he's like, what's the, why, why? he's like, do, do the buyers really care if it's in a platform or if it's a standalone? And I'm like, the buyer just cares that it actually works. That's it. Like that's the best thing some a buyer can say about your tech is like, holy crap, it actually does what we said, <laughs> what they said it would do. <laughs> exactly. That's cool. All right. I'm gonna share your I'm gonna share my screen here. I'm gonna pull up your uh blog post over at timsacket.com. And uh you had a post about the acquisitions caught my eye last week. So I want to get you on the pod and bring it to life a bit here. So yeah, let's do that. So um uh let's start out with your first idea. Video interviews will become a thing. Just kidding. That would have been an amazing prediction 10 years ago. What do you want to talk about that? You know, I think like everyone's given up on the video interview thing, but I think AI is going to um, have a resurgence of the, the strength of the video interview. Because there, again, I think what HireVue tried to do a decade ago was show like, oh my gosh, when you video somebody, there's so many attributes that you can pull from this. Um, and so I think the AI will help, right? We, we bring some of that back. The other side of it, though, is like, I think that we've missed this whole thing. And I'll give you an example. It's like, if you give a hiring manager five resumes, they're going to look at the resumes. If they don't see the right title or the right company, they're just going to be like, eh, like it, it, okay, maybe I'll interview this person, that person. Um, if you sent them literally like 30 second commercials of these individuals that were video based, that were, you know, and they would go, oh, yeah, number one, four, and five. I want to interview those folks, right? If people go, wait a minute, that could be like loaded with kind of implicit, unconscious, conscious bias and stuff like that. I'm like, good. But again, AI is going to show me my pipeline. It's going to show me if that manager is actually being biased or not. And I can address those individual issues. I don't think, I mean, again, we all have bias. I don't think people are, are, are specifically trying to be biased when they're trying to hire. I think they're trying to hire the right talent for their team. Now, do we have people that do have bias? For sure. Um, but again, my data is going to show me who those people are and I'll deal with those one-offs. The advantage of being able to move really fast with something like this. And do I think this is like a solution that's going to solve every ill that we have in TA? No, I would just love to see the selection difference between, hey, keep doing your sending resumes and applications to a manager 
or let's send a bunch of like short term, like short range video clips to a hiring manager and see what the reaction is differently in terms of how many they select an actual interview. I think they would actually select mm. more people to interview overall. Mm. It seems like the Zoom, uh, you know, pre-screen has kind of killed just the overall video, you know, uh, in the TA process almost. It's, no, it's and, and a lot of the video tech is like, oh, yeah, yeah, we record everything. So you can send the full inter like screening to a manager. Right. A manager doesn't have 20, 30 minutes to look at a stupid screen, you know, like, and here you ask the same questions over and over. What they want is they want like a highlight reel, right? Just give me the highlight reel. Just let me see like every, all five people in five minutes, you know? Yeah. Your okay. second one here is one that really, uh, I want to talk about a lot because you say AI that constantly follows up with candidates and hiring managers. Um, and that's, that's one of the biggest problems of the screening process today, the job search process, the black yeah. hole. You hear that constantly from candidates and constantly it's like we're never getting better at that communication piece, Tim. Yeah. No. And, and when I take a look at the, the recruiters that I've hired, the ones that are the best in my life, like if I had to do an all-star, you know, team of recruiters, the one commonality they would have every single time would be they, they just are maniacal about follow-up and it's both ways. They follow up with hiring managers to the point where the hiring manager goes, leave me alone. Like you're stalking me. In, in they'll, then they'll keep following up, right? Because what they know is the only way I get that position filled is if the hiring manager actually interviews and makes a decision and you have to follow up, follow up, follow up. I see this, I see this in a lot of failed recruiters, especially young recruiters that will go, yeah, I sent them like the, like the, the applications or I sent them the profile or I sent them the resumes um, on Monday. Um, and, and if I don't get here from until Friday, I'll send another email Friday following and you're like, what? No, I mean, you send them Monday morning. If I'm not hearing anything by Monday afternoon, I'm sending a message. If I not by Tuesday morning, if they haven't replied, I'm probably calling or going to visit their desk or whatever, right? Like, and then on candidates, it's the same way. It's like you you have the ability, and we see people do this different ways. Like they're like, oh, on Friday afternoons after three, I, I send every candidate that I'm in in process with. I'll send them a quick update, right? And just do it. And, and you know, the candidates appreciate that so much. I just think that this is where AI could be really good. I had a couple of vendors, Chris, that actually reached out to me and goes, oh, we already do this. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. Stop it. You don't. You don't really follow up the way a real person follows up. And I think that's where Gen AI can step in and actually make it sound like you, the recruiter, both ways. And then as things like as you, no response happens or some response happens or weird response happens, it, the AI lets you know, like, hey, here's an issue, right? That cropped up or here's a question that came um, and, and gives you the prioritization of like kind of how to re actually follow up because that's, we just don't have the capacity to, if you're working on average, like, you know, corporate recruiters working 20 to 50 recs, you know, kind of crazy numbers. There's no way they're going to be able to follow up with all those recs and all of those candidates unless they have some kind of, in my mind, an AI-driven assistant that's helping them. Yeah. Yeah, to me, we need some kind of like candidate-first applicant tracking system to come out and do this stuff, like make it a reality here. Yeah. It actually, you know, it's built from the candidate's perspective first in my so opinion. There's one problem with that that I see in corporate talent acquisition. And I do a lot of like, like enterprise level TA kind of like recruiting diagnostics. The recruiters don't use the ATS and that's not an ATS problem. It's a recruiter problem and it's a, it's a management problem. It's kind of a leadership problem, right? Because they're not, they're actually not using the ATS the way it's designed to be used. So you can actually collect data, collect process points, do all of this stuff so you understand your funnel. Because at that point, the AI could easily update candidates to say, hey, right. um, your, your um, resume or your application was sent to a hiring manager. And the recruiter and the hiring manager actually had a conversation about you today. Um, more to follow, right? And it can't, you, know, you know how like, excited a candidate would be like, holy crap, like amazing. I can't wait to hear, right? What the next steps are or whatever that might be. But the only way you get that is if you actually kind of require your recruiters to work within the process and system that you purchased because you thought it was going to help you be better. <laughs> um, and so like, I, like, I think every ATS has the ability to be a candidate first ATS with the right AI engine behind it. If again, we have our recruiters actually using it the way they should. Yeah. Um, all right. Next one. We all know there are a application bots cancer so using the help can supply to hundred jobs at a time. So there's that famous, um, 
product called lazy apply. You've probably heard of that one. Yeah. Where it lets you apply to like hundreds of jobs at once. Um, oh yeah. How's that going to affect everything? Uh, oh, I think, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it's really being widely used yet. We, I hear once in a while, I hear stuff from like, you know, what it, what it shows up as is like, it's just more recruiters going, I posted this job. I had a hundred people apply and out of the hundred, three of them were actually qualified. Right. And then you go, so why are all these people applying to jobs that they're unqualified for? And then you go, well, I mean, you know how these AI engines work. Like they're just not very, they're not, they're, you know, they take some time to actually be good and actually understand and all this other stuff. Like, and when the, the, the ones that are out there now are just literally just, they're just heavy machines that are just like, nope, well, we can force apply to 200 jobs a day or an hour or a minute or whatever. And, you know, we're just going to have you apply to everything. And it's just a matter of just numbers. I think what we'll, what we see is we're going to see those things are going to continue. We're not going to stop them. So then we need the matching um, software on top, whether that's in the ATS or a standalone product that's going to that's going to filter through all of these applications and actually let the ones that are actually qualified um, actually find the recruiter um, and make it to the next step in the process and do all of that. And in the AI actually might know, like, hey, this is actually coming from an AI bot from the application side. But this person actually is semi-qualified. Um, let's reach out to them in our own process <laughs> and actually, and you know, and have them do some pre-assessments or have them answer some other questions or you know, do some screening or whatever that might be. So I think we're going to have this battle of AIs between candidates and companies that that's going to filter out most of the garbage. I mean, at least that's my hope. Hmm. So. Yeah. Did you ever see that movie Her with Joaquin yeah. Phoenix? Yep. yep. There was a, a couple of spots in there where like his voicemail, he checked his voicemail every day. It was like, that was his AI. Yeah. And it, it read his emails to him, but it also read like, oh, you have three job offers from this and this yeah. and this. Uh, would you like me to apply to this job? Uh, and I think By the way, like Chris, I think like when you take a look at what Microsoft is doing and you take a look at all the verbal stuff, I don't think we're that far away. I think no, I we're going to be talking to our computers in 2024. It, for, in some applications, and if and if Microsoft actually beats everybody to the punch, if or Google, whoever, potentially, it might be a real thing by the end of 2024, where you, some you have like an AI reading you like your email, and you're going, yeah, skip that one, delete that one, oh, reply to that one that um you know for that we need to schedule a meeting or what, like you can just have this conversation with your AI. I think that's going to be the real thing. Yeah. We were talking about your next one at the party last week at the BFF yeah. party in New York. Uh, real human contact becomes a recruiting luxury in the future. And I totally agree with that. Yes. Um, as AI starts to take over here, but uh, it's going to be really, that's the difference between like the really good companies and recruiting in the, in, a few, in the years ahead, the ones that have real actual humans doing some of the recruiting. Yeah. And I think, I mean, again, like I'm all for the AI automation. I let, like, you know, like I'm a fan of the the fountains and the paradoxes and the human leads and all of these really good AI kind of, you know, uh, apply, you know, products that are out there. Um, but also I think there's a time when you have to put the human back into the loop and that's going to be a luxury. It's going to feel white glove. It's going to feel higher end to the candidate. And especially at a low volume recruiting, you're going to see some companies that will immediately go right to like, I mean, like you and I both know, like, the, all the big HCM recruiting mods that are out there, and even a lot of the big ATS standalones that are out there, it's painful to go through that apply process. And if you're really talented, are you going to put in 15 or 20 minutes or even five minutes of, of just aggravation to make a profile and apply to a job? Or if, if somehow it finds you and you click on something and you go, no, I just want to talk to somebody right now. Like I'm, I'm, I'm interested, but I want to talk to a real human. Now, a lot of Gen Zers, I think, and even younger millennials will go, oh God, I would never want to talk to a real person. <laughs> they say that, but when you really dig into their behavior, they want to talk to a real person after they've made the decision that, oh yeah, this is actually something I'm interested in, right? Yeah. At that point, they're done with the AI. And I think that's the key here is where, when do we turn off the AI and turn on the human in the process? And I think right now, where it's all, it's like all AI until you get to like, oh, it's an interview. Now you get to the real person. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure if that's the right spot. Um, so I think TA, there's a human element to the TA that needs to be turned on. I mean, and everyone's process and everyone's job family is going to be a little different. On that. Does this mean we've seen sort of peak recruiter staffing, Tim, as far as just the teams inside these organizations, do you think? In terms of number? Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I, I mean, again, I, I think we're going to see a, like, and we've seen this for the last three decades of automation and recruiting, right. Where we keep trying to make things better and better and better. So I think, um, the more we move into AI, the more we move into automation, I don't think you need more people. I think you're going to rearrange a lot of these people to do different jobs. And again, to me, it's that human luxury side. Yep. Uh, your last prediction, remote work yeah. is not the answer for most people. Um, I, mean, I, I think hybrid is the future, but yeah. what's your take on that? I, it, I mean, honestly, it pisses me off when I hear an HR person like beating the drum and screaming at the top of their lungs that, remote work is everything and it's the answer and blah, blah, blah. Because what it shows me is that they're actually at, at best, they're naive at worst. They're actually destructive and stupid, right? Because while it might be the right thing for them and their productivity, everybody's going to have a different level of this, right? Chris, like you're a remote guy. You're super productive. If I told you, Hey, tomorrow, I'm going to have to have you work in a cubicle and Google, you would probably be like, and you would, you know, you wouldn't be as productive, right? One but, day, maybe. <laughs> right. Maybe you would. I don't know. But some, but like here, and here's what I know is that I have people on my own team that are full remote and they're amazing and they're more productive because I actually can measure their productivity and had baseline before we went remote. And then I had people that failed and I had people that are in between. And so we keep tweaking to find out like, Hey, what is the actual optimal, like, like space for you? Is that a couple of days in the office is that three days at home is that four days in Cayman and one day like in a work, you know, we work, whatever that might be. Our job as HR professionals should be to find the optimal setup for each individual. It shouldn't be to yell and scream at the top of our lungs that every single person should be remote because that, that you're just dumb at that point. Like that's not the optimal part. And then like, I go back to younger people and we see this in university studies where they go, hey, I want an in-office experience. I might not want to be in the office five days a week, but maybe half or 75% of the time I want in-office because I need to build my network. I need to build my relationships. I need to learn. And it's really hard to do that in a fully remote capacity. Yep. Good stuff, man. So what's this about a new book I hear? Well, it's, it's kind of a new book, kind of like, so Sherm asked me to say, hey, like this talent fix, like it was five years ago. It's still selling, but we think it needs to be updated. And I said, okay. Um, and so they were like, hey, we just want to do like an updated version. And I go, well, I have so much more I want to add. And so we did update the original book, but then I literally put in almost 50% more of like a second book. So like it's doubled in size. So there's a lot of new stuff. There's updated stuff from the old stuff. Um, so it's Talent Fix Volume 2. Um, that'll be out April at Sherm Talent. So I'm super excited about that. It's 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 done. It's 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 fully baked. It's just in the publisher and the editor right now. Nice. And uh, you can buy it where on uh, Amazon's and Sherm. It'll be on Amazon Sherm store, but again, um, probably not until April. Gotcha. Yeah. Where else are you traveling this year? What, what shows? Um, I'll be at all the big ones. Um, so I'll be at uh, Talent. I'll be at National for Sherm. I'll be at HR Tech. I'll probably be at a bunch of the user conferences. I'll be at RecFest in Nashville. That was one of my favorite ones for yeah, 23. I mean, I went to the UK one a couple of times. That's amazing. So if you have a chance to go to Europe, uh, England and go to that one, you should check it out. Um, it's 98.5% European based companies and practitioners. Um, but it's amazing. And I think the one in Nashville will be the same. I'm actually bringing my full team down to this one this year. Oh, in Nashville. nice. Yeah. Pretty cool. So I thought, I mean, team. it was a miss. Um, again, I didn't know what this one would be. And then when I got down there, I was like, ah, I should have brought them all down. So we'll, we'll, we'll do it this year. Yeah. Request is a refreshing break from the traditional conference. I think it's, that's why yeah, like it. it's still, I mean, in like the one thing I found about Recfest is um, unlike a lot of the other ones is like, you end up getting into so many conversations with other practitioners and having real conversations about stuff because the content is shorter. Um, it's not right on top of each other necessarily. So you have, and you're walking, it's outdoors and you're walking from tent to tent and you just end up running into a lot of people and having conversations. And that's yeah, it was so informal, you know, it was very relaxed atmosphere yeah. and chill. And, you know, it wasn't, it was just a really pleasant experience overall. So, yeah. So I'm excited about that. And, um, my, uh, my, my youngest son is actually is going to be in Australia, um, for a semester, uh, study abroad. So at some point I'll be in Melbourne. Um, and I'm hoping to, when I'm there, I can kill two birds with one stone and find a conference or something like that way. So. Sounds good, man. All right. Well, that will do it for this episode of the Rick Tech Podcast. Tim, thanks for stopping by today. Great, to, uh, great to see you again.
Be sure to follow us on the socials, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, via the at RegTech Media handle. See every podcast, video, blog we publish. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, always be recruiting.